In the first chapter of Revelation, verse 19, the Lord gives us the key to the understanding of the book as we see the three divisions. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which will be after these things. Chapter 1, the vision that he saw, Christ walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks holding the seven stars. Chapters 2 and 3, the things of the church, the history of the church, the ministry of the church to the world. Beginning with chapter 4, you enter into an area that goes beyond church history. When the church has completed its mission, when it has completed its task on the earth, then we see in chapters uh, 4 and 5, the church in heaven, taken up, called up, as John heard the voice of a trumpet saying unto him, Come up hither, and I'll show you things that will take place after these things are the things of the church. And so we saw the church in heaven, and we saw the throne of God, and the cherubim worshiping around the throne of God. We saw the 24 lesser thrones, the elders sitting upon them. Attention was drawn to a scroll in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. The scroll being the title deed to the earth. A strong angel with a loud voice saying, Who is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals? Time for redemption has come. The redemption of the world. Actually, Jesus came to redeem the world from the powers of darkness that had taken it by forfeiture from man. The world belonged to God. He created it. God gave it to man, but man forfeited it over to Satan. But Jesus came to redeem it back to God. And so the strong angel talking about this scroll, the title deed to the earth, Time for redemption has come. Who is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals? And as John sees that no one in heaven and earth is worthy to take the scroll, he begins to weep until the elder said, Don't weep, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. He's going to take the scroll and loose the seals. So as we get into chapter 6, Though we are in the heavenly scene, as we see him now beginning to break the seven seals, yet with the breaking of each seal, there is a corresponding event that's taking place upon the earth. And so we watch it from the heavenly scene, but then we look down and see uh, the results as they transpire upon the earth with the breaking of each seal. So as you're into chapter 6, verse 1, I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals. I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and of the four cherubim saying, Come and see. So he hears this sound like a thunder. The cherubim say to John, Come and see. Look down now and see what's happening on the earth when this seal is broken. And I saw, behold, there was a white horse. He that sat upon him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. The first thing that is going to take place on the earth, once the church has been removed, will be the revelation of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, commonly called the Antichrist. I believe that the powers of darkness are in control of the world today, but yet their full power cannot yet be manifested because of a restraining force. And that restraining force that is holding back the man of sin from taking over completely is the church of Jesus Christ, and the power of God's Spirit working in the church. And I believe that as long as the church is here, that the Antichrist cannot accomplish 
his purpose of taking over the world. I believe that he would like to right now. I believe that he is waiting in the wings. I believe that he is alive on the earth today. And I believe that the only thing that is keeping back the world from going completely in the powers of darkness is the light of the world, which is the church, or the salt of the earth, which is the church, and the power of God's Spirit within the church is holding back these forces of darkness from complete control. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is talking to them about that day of the Lord will not come until, first of all, there's a falling away and the son of perdition is revealed. And he talks about how he's going to come with all kinds of miracle working powers, deceiving the world and the world following after him. But he said, that which hinders shall hinder until it is removed out of the way and then he shall be revealed. So the moment the church is taken out, caught up into heaven, there is nothing holding back the Antichrist from taking forth, uh, taking control. And so the first seal reveals and brings forth the Antichrist. I don't know who he is. I don't care to know who he is. I'm not looking for him. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And uh, his coming for the church. That's what interests me. Now when he opens the second seal. There are seven seals on this scroll. When he opens the second seal. I heard the second cherubim say, come and see. And there went out another horse. It was red. Power was given to him. And he that sat upon him to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now, in the first part of the reign of the Antichrist, he will come with a program of peace. And the world will believe that uh, problems in the world were religious fanatics. Those Christians who were insisting that Jesus Christ was the only way by which a man could enter into heaven. They were the real problems. Now that they're gone, we can have peace. And uh, it will be a time in the beginning of peace and prosperity. Uh, the wealth of the Christians will be divided by the rest of the world. And so peace and prosperity, and it will be, as far as the world is concerned, you know, this is it. We've come into the new age. Uh, we, we've come into this uh, glorious uh, new age in which we are not bothered by those Christians and their testimony. But that won't last for very long. Because when the second seal is open, then war breaks out. And as the Antichrist goes forth conquering and to conquer, as the war breaks out upon the world, uh, power to kill one another with a great sword. Then the third seal is open. As a result of the war, there's going to be a tremendous famine coming over the earth. If there were a war with nuclear weapons, it would have a tremendous effect negatively upon our food chain as uh, the radioactivity would affect the food chain. And it would then create a tremendous uh, famine. When Chernobyl uh, had that accident there in the Ukraine, and uh, it affected the food chain in uh, throughout Europe uh, for a time. And uh, so the great famine that will follow. Then when the fourth seal is open. Well, in the famine, they'll be selling a quart of wheat for about $60. That's how bad the famine will be. Fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast or fourth cherubim saying, Come. And I looked and I behold, beheld a, a pale horse. And the name of him that sat upon him was Death. And hell followed. 
And power was given to them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, if when the church is removed, the earth's population, say, is four billion people. In these first four seals, one fourth of the four billion will be killed. Now, you cannot even imagine that kind of a slaughter. One billion people in the first four seals. Now, when he opens the fifth seal, John sees under the altar the souls of those who were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are people who have missed the rapture. These are people who live on the earth after the Lord has taken his church out, but will suddenly recognize what a serious mistake they have made in their rejection of Jesus Christ as the Lord of their lives. And when the Antichrist takes over and he causes everyone to receive his mark, either in their right hand or in their foreheads, these people will have enough sense to know not to take the mark. And he has power to put to death those that refuse to take the mark. And so there will be thousands of people that will be martyred at this time because of their refusal to worship the beast or his image or to receive his mark. And so John sees these. They are under the altar of God. And they are crying with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, before you judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They were given white robes, every one of them. And it was told to them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brothers should be killed that were going to be killed. And so uh, your number isn't yet complete. There are still more that are to be martyred. So you fellows just wait a while. They can't yet come into the heavenly scene. They can't yet fully enter in to the heavenly scene. They are to wait a little longer until the full complement uh, of those that will be martyred has been accomplished. Now he sees the sixth seal. Behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, bondmen, free men, hid themselves in dens and rocks. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And so we see now the wrath of God being poured out upon the earth in this great cataclysmic judgment of God. Heavens rolled back like a scroll. From the description, it sounds as if there were a polar axis shift. The physicists tell us that there is about every 6,000 years or so, a polar axis shift where the earth shifts slightly and you have a new polar axis. And that the present polar axis, which is about 22 and a third degrees tilt from the sun, uh, is uh, not the way it has always been. There have been polar axis shifts in the past, probably causing ice ages and things of this nature. And uh, from the description of this, it sounds like how the physicists describe what would happen during a polar axis shift. 
a complete change of the weather patterns, a change of the uh, ocean floors, uh, the uh, part of the mountains sinking and the water rushing in, creating other upthrust. Uh, it's interesting in the Himalaya mountains up at 28,000 feet, they find seashells. How in the world did seashells get up at the top of the Himalayas? Well, in one of the polar axis shifts, they uh, believed that uh, the water come, came rushing in, uh, perhaps in, in the Great Depression off of uh, the Philippines, and uh, where the, the depression there is about 25,000 feet deep, covered with water, that when that took place, the water rushed in, it caused then the upthrust of the Himalayas. And uh, the, the, uh, we, we know that up at the north rim of the Grand, at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, 7,000 feet, there are seashells up there, fossilized seashells there. Uh, interesting thing, of course, just to pass on and do with it what you want. Uh, how was the Grand Canyon formed? Was it formed by a little water over billions of years or was it formed in just a very short time by a great flood of waters? The evidence seems to be that it was formed by a great flood. There was a great ocean or sea uh, up in the painted desert area. And uh, around the painted desert area, of course, we uh, have all kinds of dinosaur artifacts. And uh, that uh, probably it, it may be the last polar axis shift. There was uh, this great sea that was up there came uh, as the uh, ground was up thrust. It pushed the water down to the canyon and formed, of course, the Grand Canyon and, and that marvelous spectacle that we can see today. The interesting thing, and, and what mitigates against a, a little amount of water over uh, thousands or millions of years, is that where the, Grand, where the Colorado River enters the Grand Canyon, it's only 3,000 feet elevation. Now, did the Colorado River climb up 4,000 feet and gradually wear the thing down? Doesn't make sense, does it? That the entrance of the Colorado River, the Grand Canyon, is about 3,000 feet, and yet the top of the Grand Canyon is 7,000 feet where the erosion first began. So something to, you know, think about. And... Uh, <laughs> They don't have, you know, the geologists today don't have all the answers. They like you to think they do, but they don't. The day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Now, chapter 7. It's sort of uh, what they call parenthetical. Uh, it isn't following a sequential order. But after these things, I saw four angels... And they were standing at the four corners of the earth and they were holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels who, was, who were given power to hurt the earth and the sea and they said, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. It was 144,000 of all of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, that's, that's very plain. Not 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses. Not 144,000 of the worldwide church of God or any other group that wants to claim to be the 144,000. These very plainly, how plain can you get? They are from the 12 tribes of Israel and uh, of the tribes of the children of Israel. And if that isn't clear enough, 
It names then each tribe, 12,000 from each tribe, getting the 144,000. So there's no sense of even going into that. It's too obvious. And uh, it, it takes some kind of magic jugglery to make that mean anything else than uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. After this, I beheld, and lo, there was a great multitude. No man can number them. They were out of all nations and families and people and language groups. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all of the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four cherubim and they fell before the throne on their faces they worshiped god they said blessing glory wisdom thanksgiving honor power and might it seems like every time they give a blessing they add a few extra things you know it just was in the beginning the first thing was uh, thou art worthy to receive a uh, glory and honor uh, because thou hast created i mean just very simple but every time they uh, give these Blessings are all they add to it. And so here we're really getting into it now. Uh, honor, power, might, and wisdom, and glory, and all uh, unto him forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders asked me, Who are these who are in white robes? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, you tell me. I don't know. And he said, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sits upon the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Who are they? Going back to the previous chapter, remember under the uh, fifth seal that John saw these souls under the altar who were martyred for their uh, faith in God, in Jesus Christ. And... Uh, they were told to wait until their number is complete. Now, in chapter 7, their number has been completed. They are brought into the heavenly scene. They are obviously not the church. John would have recognized them had they been the church. The church is already there. And that's why John is sort of a, as a mystery of who these people are. Where did they come from? Well, they came up out of the Great Tribulation. They were saved after uh, the church was raptured. I do believe that once the church is raptured, you'll probably have the greatest period of evangelism that the world has ever known. Maybe a lot of you will get right at that time. <laughs> Hope so. You see, there's an easy way to go and a hard way to go. The easy way to go is to accept Christ now. Our way to go is to wait until you have to be martyred. And uh, But the thing is, if you don't have enough guts to live for him now, how in the world are you going to have uh, enough strength to die for him then? And so better to live for him now rather than have to die for him then. But there will be this great multitude. No man can number. They are there in heaven. Now, uh, if you turn to Revelation chapter 20 for just a moment... Verse 4, it's a verse that has created confusion with a lot of people uh, because they put the resurrection, rapture and resurrection here at verse 4 of chapter 20. But I want to show you the error of that. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. That is the church. He sees the church sitting upon the thrones. Jesus said, He that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I have overcome and sat, sat at my Father's throne. Paul said, 
to the Corinthians, you ought not to be going to court with one another, to the secular courts. Don't you realize that these issues ought to be resolved within the church? Don't you know that you're going to be judging angels? And so I saw the thrones, they that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them. That's the church. But now he sees a second number. I saw the souls of them who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had they received his mark upon their foreheads or upon their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not rise until the end of the thousand years was over. So, you see, John saw two groups. He saw this group uh, that uh, came up out of the Great Tribulation, not the church. Notice their place here in chapter 7. They are before the throne of God. We are sitting upon the thrones. They serve Him day and night in His temple. We reign with Him as the church. And... uh, So uh, they they are a separate company, a large company, that will be brought in after the rapture of the church and they'll be brought up out of the great tribulation. And so when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of about a half an hour. We just had silence for the space of 10 seconds. Seemed like a long time, didn't it? (laughs) Imagine what it will be like when silence for the space of a half hour. Silence can be rather awesome. And uh, probably it will be in just shock and just sort of in awe of what has transpired and what is about to transpire. I saw the seven angels which stood before God. They were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having the golden censer and was given unto him to offer much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came from with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer. He filled it with fire of the altar. He cast it to the earth. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared to sound. When the first angel sounded, there followed hail, fire mingled with blood that was cast upon the earth. The third part of the trees were burnt up and all of the green grass was burnt up. So the first trumpet brings uh, a biological disaster as far as the earth is concerned. Uh, All of these tree huggers are going to have a bad time. Uh, As a third part of the trees will be destroyed and a third part uh, and all of the green grass. The second trumpet, it affects the burning fire and cast into the sea. Third part of the sea becomes as blood. Third part of the creatures which are in the sea that had life died. A third part of the ships were destroyed. The third trumpet, the angels sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. The part of the waters that became wormwood and many people died of the waters because they were made bitter, poisoned. And so the great plague of of the fresh water supplies being destroyed. The fourth angel sounded. Third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon. A third part of the stars. And so as a third part of them were dark and the day did not shine except for a third part of it and the night likewise. I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by the reason of the three trumpets just to sound. And fellows, you haven't seen anything yet is what the angel's saying. Watch out. This is just the beginning. Woe, woe, woe. Three trumpets yet to sound. And so to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of these three trumpets yet to sound. 
chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded. I saw a star that was falling from heaven unto the earth. To him was given the key of the abuso, uh, the bottomless pit. Uh, the abuso is would appear from the scriptures is a shaft uh, that goes from the surface of the earth into the heart of the earth. It would appear that Hades is in the heart of the earth. Uh, that the abuso is a shaft that goes in to Hades, called the bottomless pit. And uh, or it's, it's actually, that's the translation of, of the abuso, the abyss, this bottomless pit. And there arose the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Been interesting, say, when uh, Karkatua, uh, that's what it was, a uh, great volcano that uh, exploded uh, in the Pacific. It colored the sunsets around the world for several years as the dust went into the atmosphere and, and it actually created sort of a, a cold spell for a while because it began to shut out uh, the sun and its effect upon the earth. And, and so here we find uh, with this fifth trumpet, this uh, pit that is open, the smoke comes out of it. But out of the smoke come these demonic hordes. And these demonic hordes are described... Uh, by John, uh, it, but they are told uh, that they are not to hurt the grass of the earth, which of course is the locust usual uh, fare, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So the 144,000, they are instructed not to hurt them, But to them was given that they should not kill people, but that they should be tormented for five months. The torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days men will seek death and shall not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. You know... We think of death as such a horrible thing, but in reality, in many cases, death is a blessing. Think of a person whose body has been mangled in a car accident, and their body is totally mangled. But think of them not being able to die, and they have to just remain in that painful, mangled condition they just don't die. You see, there are times when death is a blessing. But death is going to take a five-month holiday. And people will not be able to die for five months during this time that these demonic hordes are inflicting their torment upon the people that are here on the earth. The shape of the locusts were like horses that were prepared to battle. Their heads were like... Crowns of gold, their faces were faces of men. They had hair like a woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates as they were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails that were like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and power was given to hurt men for five months. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon in Greek and or, or in Hebrew, but Apollyon in Greek. They both mean destroyer. As we were saying yesterday, sin is a destroyer. And uh, the king of the Abuso is named destroyer. One more is past. You see, I told you, you hadn't seen anything yet. When these... Last three woes bring such calamity upon the earth, here inflicting torment, pain, uh, like the pain of a scorpion when a person is stung. But because these are demonic spirits, there will be no escaping from them. 
You can't hide from them. There is no escape from them. You will wish you were dead. You might even try to commit suicide, but it won't work. You'll just be left in your mangled state. The sixth angel sounded. I heard the voice of the four horns of the golden altar, which were before God. They said to the sixth, saying to the sixth angel, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. These four angels in the great river Euphrates are bound by God for the sake of man. They are absolutely the fiercest, probably most diabolical creatures that have ever been created. And for the sake of man, God has kept them bound. Now, you do read in uh, Peter and also in Jude about those angels which kept not their first estate, who are reserved in chains of darkness, awaiting the day of judgment. Now the day of God's judgment has come, and these four angels are going to be released. Listen to what happens. They are angels which are prepared for an hour of a day and of a month and of a year to slay a third Part of men. When they're released, they'll go forth, and another one third of the remaining population of the earth will be destroyed. So, in the first four seals, one quarter of the earth's population will be destroyed. Again, surmising that, or saying that the earth's population maybe would be four billion people, one billion killed uh, in the first four. Uh, of the seals. Now by these two angels, a remaining third or another billion will be killed, which will mean that the earth's population will have been halved by just uh, these two out of the many different plagues that will be coming. There is one scripture in the Old Testament that does signify that about only one person out of Ten will survive this great period of judgment when God pours out his wrath upon the earth that there will only be about one in ten who will actually survive this great tribulation. So I saw the number of the army of the horsemen. There were 200,000 thousand or 200 million I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and those that sat upon them having breastplates of fire and jankinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion and out of their mouths there issued fire, smoke, brimstone. And by these three, a third part of men were killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their powers in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were likened to serpents, that had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, and here's the amazing thing to me, those that survive, you'd think at this point they would be on their knees crying out for the mercy of God. But rather than that, the rebellious heart is even hardened against God. More or less like Pharaoh, when the plagues began to come, he had hardened his heart, and now God just sort of sets it. And if you harden your heart over and over again, you're always in danger of God setting it. And when God sets your heart, you're you're in a hopeless state. So the rest of the men that were not killed by these plagues, yet they did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should worship devils. You know, I'm amazed today at how many people are getting into uh, the worship of Satan. Uh, many of our young people by the rap groups, the rock groups and so forth are being drawn into satanic worship and they, they become so involved in it. Here they are not, they will not repent of their worship of devils or their idols of gold and silver and brass. That is the material things that men is clamoring for today. Uh, neither the, these gods that cannot see nor hear nor walk, neither did they repent of their murders, the abortion of so many 
children, babies today, nor of their sorceries, which is the use of drugs, uh, pharmakia, nor of their fornication, uh, nor of their thievery, uh, the things that are plaguing the world today, and yet they will not repent, though God is already bringing severe judgment upon them. Now in chapter 10, we have what is known again as a parenthetical. This is just thrown in. It's, it's, so, it's so bleak, it's so dark, it's so horrible uh, that uh, the Lord's going to just throw in a, a, a bright shaft of light now uh, for just a moment. Because as we get into chapter 10, uh, we get into uh, the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Uh, this is just thrown in the middle uh, just to keep you from... Uh, despairing totally. Uh, we'll get it more fully when we get to the 19th chapter. But I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and with a rainbow upon his head. His face were as it were the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. He had in his hand a little scroll that is now open. And he set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot upon the earth. He cried with a loud voice as what a lion roars when he had cried and seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Wouldn't you like to know what the seven thunders said? Well, I can't tell you. <laughs> it was sealed up. We don't know. So we just left to wonder. But the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. He swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and all of the things that are therein, and the earth and all the things that are therein, and the sea and all of the things that are therein, that there should be no more delay. Uh, that is, uh, time shall be no more is, is a poor translation. There's not going to be any more of a delay as far as the setting up of the kingdom of God, there's been a delay of God setting up His kingdom. There's been almost 2,000 years of delay of the setting up of the kingdom. So much so that Peter, writing of the last days, said there would be scoffers that would come. And they would say, where is the promise of His coming? Since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. But they're ignorant, willfully ignorant of this one thing. That God did bring judgment on the earth once before in the form of the flood. But Peter said that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And know this, that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years as a day. So you say, well, where's the promise? It's been 2,000 years almost since Jesus left. You know, where's the promise coming? Well, it's been a couple days. <laughs> so when the Lord says, behold, I come quickly. Yeah, I might be two days before I get there, you know. Uh, and, and so that's where we run into difficulty, time from our perspective and time from God's perspective. And our first night, I think it was, that we dealt with uh, eternal versus the uh, time continuum. And uh, you can get the tape if you weren't here. Uh, but uh, we discussed that earlier. So there will be no more delay. In other words, the kingdom is going to be set up. And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And so, it's going to happen. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and it said, Go and take the little book, or the scroll, which is open in the hand of the angel. The seals have been broken, so now it's open that stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And so I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it, eat it, 
That is, uh, devour it. Read it. Uh, you know, you say, you say a guy, I got his new book yesterday. Oh, it's great. I devoured it last night, you know. Well, it means that you pulled out the pages and put ketchup on and eat. No. <laughs> it means that you read it and understood it. You grasped it. And so here is the scroll. Devouring. Uh, you know, just the contents, realizing what it is. And sweet in, in the mouth. I mean, to realize, yes, the kingdom has come. But then bitter in the stomach when you realize the tragedies that had to transpire and, and the devastation that took place in order to bring the kingdom about. And so uh, then they told John, uh, you must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. John, your job isn't over yet. There's still a uh, prophecy that you must give. And, of course, that's this book of Revelation. Chapter 11, John is given a read. It's like a Stanley tape. The angel stood and he said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those that worship therein. Now, when the Antichrist first comes on the scene, Daniel 9, 27, he will make a covenant with the nation of Israel. There will come a covenant, a Palestinian covenant, if you would, But it is a covenant with the nation of Israel whereby they will be allowed to rebuild their temple. And because of this covenant that allows them to rebuild their temple, the Jews will believe that this man is the Messiah. And they will begin to hail him as the Messiah. It's an interesting thing if you go to Israel today and you talk to the rabbis about Jesus Christ, they will tell you that they do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You say, why? He fulfilled the prophecies. Well, he claimed to be the Son of God. We do not believe the Messiah will be the Son of God. Moses said there will arise a prophet like unto myself. Moses was a man. The Messiah will be a man. Obvious question. If the Messiah is a man, then how will you know he is the Messiah? How will you recognize him? And their answer comes back, he will lead us in the rebuilding of our temple. So in Daniel 9.27, where he makes a covenant with the people, uh, and in that covenant, the rebuilding of the temple, no doubt on the temple mount, but next to the Dome of the Rock. According to Ezekiel chapter 42, uh, there will be a wall that will be put there on the temple surrounding the new temple that is to be built. And uh, it is to separate, Ezekiel said, the holy place from the profane. Notice here, John is measuring the new temple in the courts. But he said the court that is without, or that is the outer court, do not measure it, for it is given to the Gentiles. And the holy city they shall tread underfoot for 42 months, three and a half years. So he is told not to measure the outer court where the dome of the uh, rock mosque stands today. I believe that the solution will come in allowing the Muslims to continue to worship on the Temple Mount, only on the southern section of it, The northern section walled off and given to the Jews for the rebuilding of their temple. And that will be the solution that will uh, come to pass uh, as they try and unravel this extremely difficult, uh, well, it looks like an impossible uh, situation uh, of bringing peace to the Holy Land. And and this will be the way that it will be uh, brought to pass. Now, uh, After three and a half years, in the midst of the seven-year period, 
The temple has been rebuilt. The Jews have started worshiping again in the temple. They start sacrifices again. But then this man of sin will come back to Jerusalem. And he will stand in the Holy of Holies. And he will declare that he is God. He will demand that they worship him as God. And at that point, the Jews will flee from Israel to a place that God has prepared over in Jordan where they will be kept by God for the three and a half years of the great tribulation that is coming upon the earth. So a uh, couple of verses there in the beginning of chapter 11. Now, he said, I will give power. He's talking about two witnesses that he's going to send. He'll give power and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. So again, we go back to a 360 day year because it's 42 months, three and a half years. And so 1,260 days, a 360 day year, which most of your Bible prophecy is predicated upon the Babylonian calendar of 360 days to the year. So uh, these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. You go back in the book of Zechariah and you pick up that uh, uh, symbolism. And, the, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, they must in this manner be killed. You remember when Elijah was uh, a prophet, the king sent a captain down with 50 men to arrest him. And he said, oh, man of God, you know, the king has sent me to arrest you. He said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Fire came down and consumed him as 50 men. King sent another captain with 50 men. Said, oh, man of God, you know, king has sent me to arrest you. He said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Fire came and consumed him. The third captain came down with his 50 men. He said, please, sir, I'm a family man. I have children at home. Have mercy on me, you know. The king wants you. You know, wouldn't you please go? And, of course, Elijah went with him. But uh, notice here now they again have power to call down fire from heaven uh, upon their adversary. So Elijah will be one of the two witnesses. Now, the other one, the identity, uh, Malachi tells us that Elijah is one of the two. So we know Elijah. But the other one, uh, the mystery is, uh, is a mystery. Could be Enoch. It's appointed unto man once to die. It looks like Enoch missed his appointment. Uh, it could be Moses uh, because they have power to bring plagues. And Moses brought the plagues upon the Egyptians. It would be interesting if it were Moses because he is, of course, the, the one that the Jews look to. He represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And wouldn't it be very wise of God to send the representative for their law and the prophets of the Jews? Because that's what they boast about. We have the law, we have the prophets. And so you send the lawgiver Moses and you send uh, the chief of the prophets Elijah and uh, so uh, it could be that Moses will be the companion of Elijah. They, they both, they seem to hang around together at least. They both were with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember. Uh, when Jesus was transfigured, Moses and Elijah appeared together. So it could be buddies and uh, they'll be the two uh, that uh, are here on the earth at that time. They have power to shut up heaven. You remember Elijah prayed and it rained not. He shut up heaven for a period of years until there was a great drought. And uh, they have power to turn the waters into blood. You remember and with Moses, the Nile River and the fresh water supplies were turned to blood. To smite the earth with all of the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, and I like this, when they have finished their testimony. Notice, you can't do anything to these guys until they're finished. And I believe that God has a purpose, a plan for each of our lives, and until that purpose and plan is fulfilled, that God's going to sustain us. And once the purposes are fulfilled, who wants God to sustain him here in this rotten place any longer? You know, let's get on with the show. Let's go to heaven and let's get on, you know, in the glorious presence of the Lord and all. So when they had finished their testimony, the Antichrist, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, 
will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. So the city of Jerusalem, their bodies will be lying there in the streets of Jerusalem for three days. And the people and the families and the tongues of the nations shall see the dead bodies. Wait a minute. How can the whole world see dead bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem? You know, a few years ago, that would have been a real problem, wouldn't it? Until we had satellite transmission of television and so forth. And now it's possible for something to happen in Jerusalem and for us to be watching on our TVs and see it just as it's taking place in Jerusalem. So uh, uh, all of these guys, uh, you know, that are so uh, liberal, the CBS commentators and ABC and... Uh, all of these guys, they'll be over there and they'll be saying, there they are. Those are the two guys that caused all of the problems that, uh, you know, that created the droughts and those fellows and, you know, and they'll be, you know, talking back and forth about them. And suddenly, (laughs) after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God will enter into them and they stood upon their feet And a great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven. It's saying to them what it said to the church back in chapter 4, 1. Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and the enemies beheld them. And in the same hour there was a great earthquake. A tenth part of the city fell. The earthquake were slain of men, 7,000. The remnant were frightened. They gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe comes quickly. So the seventh angel sounded. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders which sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces, they worshiped God, and they said, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, which is to come, because you have taken to you your great power, and you have reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, the time of the judgment of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to those that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Covenant. Now, people wonder, where is the Ark of the Covenant today? Well, it's probably in heaven. Uh, the Ethiopians say that they have it. Uh, the phalanges there in Ethiopia say they've been protecting it. But uh, John sees it here in heaven. However, the earthly Ark was just a model of heaven, so it is possible that the earthly uh you know, Ark of the Covenant is around someplace, but uh, the, the true John sees there in heaven, and there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, earthquake, and a great hail. That's as far as we can go tonight, uh, but we're not finished. Uh, there's uh, still other things to be transpiring. Now, we, we've sort of come in a chronological order. But now we're going to go and fill in details. Uh, you've been given sort of the skeleton. Uh, now come details of, of some of the things that are transpiring during uh, this three and a half years of great tribulation that is coming upon the earth. And we'll go back and pick those up, uh, the details up, as we uh, move in from chapter 12 and Chapter 13, the Antichrist, we get information of him. And uh, we, uh, we'll we just move on next time uh, through the rest of the... Uh, we're going to have to take two more sessions because uh, we've got the final session. We're going to take you to heaven. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> And that, to me, is one of the most exciting parts of the book when we see beyond the earth, beyond the earth things, the new heaven, the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. And uh, so 
uh, we'll move ahead. Father, we thank you for uh, the fact that you have not left us to just grope in the darkness of this world. But you have given to us, Lord, the map. Uh, you've given to us the score, so to speak, so that uh, we know exactly where we are. As we look around the world today, Lord, we see a world that is ready and ripe for judgment. And so, Lord, we pray that we in these last days, in this dark world in which we live, will shine forth as a light to lighten the path for those people who are in darkness. Lord, help us as your church to be a strong witness for you, to live in such a way, Lord, detached from the things of the world, walking and living after the Spirit, committing ourselves, Lord, in these final hours to witnessing and serving you, Lord, like we have never witnessed and served before. God, light a fire in each of our hearts. And may it just burn brightly, Lord, that we might be your witnesses, all that you would have us to be in these final hours. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have of escaping these things that will be coming to pass upon the earth, that we might be standing there in the heavenly scene, rejoicing in the worthiness of the Lamb, to open the scrolls, to loose the seals, because he was slain and redeemed us by his blood out of the nations. Lord, there are those here tonight who have been playing around with the things of the world, dabbling in things that they have no business getting involved with. Many of them, Lord, have become bound by these things started off as sort of a lark but now it's a noose around their neck and they find themselves Lord in the bondage of corruption and as we see the day approaching Lord how they need to be free and we know, Lord, that only you can set a man free from the power of sin, from the power of darkness. Lord, there are those that are here tonight that are not ready for you to come. And if you should come tonight, Lord, they'd be left to face these horrible things that are going to be happening upon the earth once the church is taken out. Help them to realize, Lord, how serious are these things. That these aren't just John dreaming up wild things in his imagination, but these are a revelation of God to John of the things that are going to transpire. And Lord, we see in the world today the beginnings of these things already. And so we do ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would speak to their hearts tonight. And may they get right with God. May they surrender their lives, Lord, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the end of this message. If you would like further information on any of our products or to receive our free catalog, contact The Word for Today. The address is P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. Or you may reach us by our toll-free number. 1-800-272-WORD. That's 1-800-272-WORD.